think by now we must be the most crowdfunded fashion project in Europe. This is Casper. Casper is from Denmark. We call the technology Fresco. By adding a protective layers to the cotton fibers, it's possible to create a fabric that repels everything from red wine, coffee, beer, and many other substances. Explain to me what Lab Fresh is. It's just a more human company than most. Yeah. Is that scalable? Yeah, that's a good question. That is just, it just makes sense. You're used to being in school and comparing your grades with everyone else. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you graduate, you're looking at who gets a job the fastest, who gets jobs at the coolest places, or the best titles, or the highest salaries. You compare everything when you just graduate. And that's stupid. Like, I have never felt like I have to be a success in terms of money I earn, or prestigious job titles, or something like that, for people to like me. And then it's easier to be great. Of course. Casper. Ryan. I like to start all my podcasts with the exact same question because I feel like often it establishes how the rest of the conversation is going to continue. And that question is, are you happy? Uh, yes, I would say so. What, in your opinion, is required to live a happy life? This got deep really fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I'm more happy now than when I was younger because... It's my third startup now and like I have an age now where I'm much more aware of where I get my good vibes and my good energy. And I've been lucky and fortunate that I could design my company and my relationship and my life around the things that gives me that energy. Mm -hmm. For this podcast, I have a guiding research hypothesis that passion gives purpose. What is your opinion on that? That sounds about right. What or how would you describe your passion? Uh, my passion is building things since I was a young man mm -hmm. and not with my hands or my, with my hands if they touch a keyboard or something like that but mm -hmm. it's not about oh I can build a house with my hands right it's more like taking something that's tiny and insignificant and has no value to no one and then suddenly you see it getting traction around the world that's that sense of traction thousands of people being engaged about your product mm -hmm. I love it You already mentioned uh, you. this is now the third company you founded. So what were those first experiences with entrepreneurship like for you? Uh, if there's time for the long answer, I guess of it's a podcast. Of course, there is, there is time, more than enough. Yeah, so then all three, were, all three startups were very like, uh, foundational experiences for, for me and where I am today. Mm -hmm. And the first one basically started... Uh, I started when I was 20. Mm -hmm. I was studying uh, my bachelor in economics and communication. And then there was this guy at my, uh, in my batch who received an investment of, I think it was 100,000 euros from an ancient investor. Mm -hmm. And this was back in 2006, something like that. So I never heard the term before. And I found it highly unusual and irresponsible of a grown-up, of, of an adult, to give 100,000 euros to one of my friends. Yeah. <laughs> and I was asking him to see, what did you show him? What, can I see the business plan you gave him to, to get that kind of money? And then it was 14 pages in a PowerPoint presentation mm -hmm. with amazing graphs about how they were going to do mobile gaming, uh, social gaming on, uh, on Nokia phones. And that blew my mind. Mm -hmm. Then I started doing some work for them. And I started hanging out in their apartment where they were having their office and they were also sleeping there. And I thought it was the coolest apartment I had ever been in. And there was yeah. all these amazing creative people around them. Yeah. And because of that, then, yeah, I created my first startup, Small Fist PR, where okay. we would help companies like them getting uh, attention and streamlining their communication and PR and all that stuff mm -hmm. when they launch. Okay. I worked on that for a couple of years while doing my master and realizing that was really, really hard work for not a lot of money <laughs> and I needed yeah. to learn from, from some grown-ups. Yeah. So when I graduated, I was lucky to get into the biggest company in Denmark mm -hmm. called Maersk. And in there, I was wearing a suit and tie every day. I was traveling around the world. I was having an American Express and feeling very important and uh, like basically all the things that you need when you're 25 years old and you just want to feel significant. Mm -hmm. uh, after a couple of years, I felt like I learned enough. And I moved to Amsterdam, where I am now. I'm originally from uh, Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. And I started my first real startup, The Glocum, which uh, was a personal shopping service for men. In that one, my mindset was that happiness and the only thing I need is to raise a bunch of money and go really, really hard. Mm -hmm. 
uh, we got in total 3 million euros in venture capital. I think I was 26 at the time. And in hindsight, that was really irresponsible to give us that money because we went really, really hard. <coughs> we hired 55 people in a couple of years, burned all the money, also reached uh, more than 10 million in revenue in the end. Uh, but then it was not a sustainable business. Everything yeah. was chaos. Mm -hmm. It was very immature. So we had to, to sell it in a not very good deal to our German competitors. Okay. And me and a bunch of other people had to move to Berlin. Uh -huh. And then I was then sitting down in Berlin in what you call vesting in peace. Mm -hmm. Where you kind of, in order to get your money, you have to stay there for a while. Yeah. And that's when I realized my next startup, that's going to be it. That's going to be the one where I reach this intense feeling of happiness and purpose and passion. Mm -hmm. And I'm only going to do it with nice people. I don't want any venture capitalists. Mm -hmm. I don't want any annoying uh, co-founders, nothing like that. So we created our own product. Uh, my co-founder is the girl I'm marrying. Mm -hmm. uh, the investors are our first customers, 18 individuals instead of real f funds. And uh, we've been doing it exactly the way we wanted since the beginning. And it feels really good. Mm -hmm. It means I don't have any real investments. I also didn't take over the world yet. Mm -hmm. But it's still, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's working on it. <laughs> uh, well, it's not even that important for me to take over the world. I yeah. just think it's really, really nice that we can open a bunch of nice stores, give people good salaries, hire amazing people, and uh, and and also still live our life and have our dream house and whatever mm -hmm. else matters. Yeah, and the company you're talking about that is Lab Fresh, obviously. That's the one you're sitting in <laughs> right now, in uh, on the ground floor where we have our flagship store. Mm -hmm. On top of it, we have our uh, office space mm -hmm. and uh, we're building this exact same concept in Copenhagen to open next month yeah yeah um, it's obviously a beautiful location and a very I would say modern like approach with the co-working and uh, explain to me what lab fresh is so lab fresh was something I started thinking about many years before we launched it because when I was in Maersk and wearing a suit and tie every day the last year I was there, I had almost 200 travel days. And it was in Nigeria, Oman, Dubai, India, like all the warmest and most humid places you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And I used to be a student, but now I was traveling in a suit and a white shirt, mm -hmm. 14 hours in a plane and then get straight into meetings. And I thought it was incredibly stupid <laughs> that you were forced to wear this clothes. Yeah. It was always wrinkled. It was always, it was horrible. And mm -hmm. um, so, <laughs> When I was stuck in Berlin, we found all these new technologies within hiking and the military, the uniforms of military and so on, that were not being utilized by fashion brands. Mm -hmm. And I just started straight up uh, friending these professors and scientists that had the patents via LinkedIn, met with them, got some exclusive rights, and then we started making these stain and odor repellent shirts. Mm -hmm. That's basically how we got started. We just wanted to make menswear with sportswear technology. Right. And why, why this mission? Uh, well, one thing is that when I had that personal shopping service, uh, we were selling all the normal brands, uh, Tommy Hilfiger and Scotch and Soda and whatever. And it was all about selling as much clothing as possible. And I was sick and tired of that. I wanted to build a brand where we would sell as little clothing as possible. Mm -hmm. And I realized early on that what deteriorates the fibers in your clothing is when you wash it. Mm -hmm. So if you want to make products that last as long as possible, you got to make products that you wash very little. Mm -hmm. You probably recognize that from your, from your own wardrobe. Yep. So now we, t-shirts like this, our customers wear an average 3.5 days between washes. Mm -hmm. But a normal t-shirt, our customers wear for 1.3 days between washes. Mm -hmm. Meaning that the lifetime you get out of these products are so much higher. Yeah. And yeah, that was the whole purpose behind it, that people will, our customers will buy less products than the customers of Tom Hilfiger. Mm -hmm. the, the way you said it, sell as little clothes as possible that goes entirely against traditional businesses. Yeah, it's not a very good pitch in a PowerPoint <laughs> <day. laughs> No. Uh, why or what is it for you that makes you different from the traditional approach? Um, I also care about selling things because top line growth is what enables everything nice about being an entrepreneur and having a business. Mm -hmm. But I believe that you can, if you create a change in consumption patterns, 
that's the most sticky of behaviors. Mm-hmm. And then it's okay that people don't buy 10 shares a year, but five, because they will stay with you for many years. Yeah. And that's the reason why we are focused on men who are 30 plus. They care because they are the most loyal, loyal humans in the world. Okay. And especially businessmen who wear white and blue shirts every day. Mm-hmm. You know, when I started at Musk, half the people still had Blackberries. Yeah. Like they, they kept their Nokia phones longer than anyone else. <laughs> okay. So we just decided we're going to treat everyone incredibly well with the service and make products that are great. And then the whole idea about, I had these, these socks I have on now, I have on the whole week. Right? Yeah. I only take socks on Sundays. Yeah. That's sticky behavior. Yeah. Suddenly other socks seem really old school. Yeah. That means I will probably keep buying my socks from that brand. On your LinkedIn profile, you said, just a quote, in 2013, I quit my corporate job at the world's largest shipping line. I went from wearing a suit and tie to sitting on cardboard boxes in an old apartment. What were those first months like for you leading up to the transition where you decided, this is it, I'm going to do something else, but also sort of those first months of building the company? Um, in hindsight, I think I, I should have been better at enjoying that period. Mm-hmm. Or maybe I was a little bit tense. Um, I was earning a very... Which, which period? Sorry. Uh, the be- period leading up to quitting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but that period was quite amazing because I got a lot of energy out of all these ideation phases in my spare time. Going to start up meetups and hang out with my friends and trying to come up with a great idea. Mm-hmm. That's actually a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. But I was a little bit in a hurry. Mm-hmm. And I was also working a lot at my full-time job. So then was a, I, I forgot to enjoy it. Right. Um, but that phase was basically, I had been on the road there for, for such a long time. Mm-hmm. I came back to Copenhagen. And that, then I started, I was still eating in the office three, time, uh, three mo- meals a day. Mm-hmm. I was training in there. I was showering there. Basically I, living there. <laughs> and I was living in my old student apartment also. Right. Okay, yeah. So, ex- and, but my salary was, uh, was very high. Uh, so I could save up something like 4,000 euros a month. Uh, that way I was stacking up. Yeah. And then when I found someone to start a business with, I was telling him uh, that as soon as we can find a real angel investor who wants to put in money, mm-hmm. I will quit my job. Okay. But until we have an angel investor, I will not quit, even though we were pre-revenue. And then I just kept saving up money. And when we got the first investor in, I kept it so that the face, the face when we went to the apartment and was, and was sitting on the cardboard boxes, I had this feeling, oh, I saved up some money. So worst case scenario, I just enjoyed this for six months. If it doesn't pan out, I'm going to go backpacking for six months with my savings. Yeah. So it was important for me to not put everything I own into it because mm-hmm. I would be a really shitty co-founder. I would be really tense and not nice to people. Yeah. Now instead I was relaxed and enjoying the, the ride. Is that... Um advice it worked for me okay yeah but uh everyone is different some people also need to have their back against the wall Mm -hmm. in order to really go all in work hard and get shit done Mm -hmm. i have always been relatively good at getting shit done so i don't need to feel like if i fail at this my life is over got it the reason why i ask about those first few months in particular is because i think for reflecting on myself and probably the listeners as well it's that transition of saying okay we're gonna do this that is almost the hardest there are arguments for like the first few months but that transition of dedicating that is sort of the first step you know um so that's why i was wondering where you um, get your i guess self-confidence or like self-belief from like what Mm. How did you manage to tell yourself, no, we're going to do this? It- yeah, yeah, like flicking that switch. Mm-hmm. Until you do that, mm-hmm. a lot of people also have a very long period where they kind of don't share with any, anyone that they want to do it. But they have a few coffees here and there and they think a lot about it. Mm-hmm. But they're not being vocal and they're not putting dates on stuff. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I talk to people who's been in that phase for, for years. Yeah. So it's important for me to say, I need to get this out of my system. Yeah. And it's just going to happen. Um, and I think it comes from my childhood and from my okay. parents, uh, because this is so much easier to do when you feel like worst case scenario, I'm going to move back in my dad's house 
mm-hmm. and he makes some excellent food all the time and I still have a, a big room there and then it's all gonna be fine yeah like I have never felt like I have to be a success in terms of money I earn or prestigious job titles or something like that for people to like me yeah uh, and then it's easier to be brave of course yeah You're taking on a huge industry with the idea of Lab Fresh, right? The clothing is industry is massive in general. Um, do you ever struggle with imposter syndrome? Imposter syndrome? Nah, I wouldn't say so because we don't play the fundraising game. Mm-hmm. We've, we finance it with our customers and profits. So we don't have to talk a big game all the time and go out and tell everyone that we're going to take over the world. Right. We can all the time play. We, we do the opposite. Mm-hmm. Uh, we very much use what you call vernacular branding mm-hmm. and user generated content. Mm-hmm. So we try to be super transparent and authentic. Sharing when we have problems and things are not working and trying to make people feel like they're buying from Casper and Lotte instead of from a big successful scale up or something like that. Yeah. And it's not a big company, we are 17 people mm-hmm. and you are buying from me and Lotte. We are involved in everything and yeah. I like it like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Playing the little dog also mm-hmm. works really well yeah. in Denmark and the Netherlands. Um, if we were in the US, you, you, you have to blow yourself up more. You have to say that this is the world's best shirt, stuff like mm-hmm. that. In Denmark and the Netherlands, you can be more, you, you can hold back just like the Danish beer brand Carlsberg. Mm-hmm. Their slogan is uh, probably the best beer in the world. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we also have more humility, uh, a yeah. bit more humble. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Would you uh, quantify or like name yourself a sustainable brand? Uh, we don't do it that much. But I think compared to 99 point something percent of all brands, we are very much so. Yeah. I. If I claim sustainability too much though, that's when I will feel like an imposter. Right. Because you realize really quickly that there's a lot you can do. Yeah. And if we did all of it, our products would be would be too expensive. Yeah. So at some point you have to make a compromise between the ultimate sustainability product mm-hmm. and a product that you can actually run a business on. Yeah. So all the new shirts and pants we make, for example, they are made out of recycled materials mm-hmm. and corn. Mm-hmm. And that's one thing, a lot of brands are doing that. But because we also add our technology, then people wash them less mm-hmm. and you use less energy on that. You keep them for more years. And uh, yeah, I think those those parts combined mm-hmm. is the strongest approach you can have when it comes to durability. Mm-hmm. What we don't do is go into crazy details about the water consumption during, uh, during um, production of the fabrics or something like that. It's just such a complicated topic. Mm-hmm. Really huge companies are doing it. It would be very cumbersome and expensive. So we focus on the, the area that has been neglected by the big brands instead, which is the new technologies. Right. So you then don't necessarily experience sort of added scrutiny of claiming your sustainable business because you don't. Uh, we're going to start claiming it more. But okay. in, indeed, uh, the times where we have been a bit... Uh, loud Mm -hmm. about sustainability that is why you will see a lot of comments from people who are not actually customers Mm -hmm. and probably would never buy our brand Mm -hmm. but then there's perfectly good reason to to hate reasons to hate recycled polyester or organic cotton or whatever like that that, there's very few materials that are bulletproof yeah so that will yeah there's just a lot of a lot of hate whenever you start claiming these things and I don't mm. really need to engage in that. No, understandable. Yeah. And that's not that's not why our customers are buying our brand. We are really close with them. We do tons of surveys. Yeah. It's very clear in every single survey. Mm-hmm. The number one and two reasons are that they want to have less visible sweat stains mm-hmm. and they want to not worry about whether they are smelling like sweat. Mm-hmm. That's it. Sustainability is really far down on the, on the list. Yeah. That's just something that we care about more mm-hmm. than the customers care about it. Understandable. I'm fascinated by this, um, by your sort of approach to raising money. It's, in my opinion, I've seen at least very few brands that do that by talking to their customers, getting them to essentially invest, making them part of the process, as you just explained, and 
giving them certain benefits. It's very different approach. And the reason why I asked this question is because I spoke with Ron Simpson a couple of weeks ago, and he uh, talked to me about how his approach to life is that when your back is up against the wall, some people choose A or B. He always looks for an option C if A and B don't fit what he needs. And it seems like that is the same, at least in this scenario, where you were like, uh, I don't want to take on investors, venture capital. Um, I'm going to go for a different route. Do you recognize that in the rest of your life or where, where does this sort of thinking outside of the box come from? Yeah, so yeah, that's a very good question. Good topic. I think so. It's, it's always been there for me that I was a contrarian thinker. When I was 16 years old, I joined a very libertarian youth political organization. Mm -hmm. I was in all the debates and I always had the, the opposite opinion. You can have 10 people here with one opinion. I will take the yeah, exactly the, the one contrarian one. Mm -hmm. And then my master degree is also in something called strategic market creation, mm -hmm. which is finding the blue oceans, the, the, the small tweaks to a business model that no one else has done. Right. So that's what yeah, that's where I have a passion. Yeah. And in terms of investments, it's just that I tried it with venture capital. Yeah. And it didn't fit my personality enough. You have to if you raise a lot of money, you also have to burn it. Yeah. And I thought it would be really cool to try to make it a profitable yeah. company mm -hmm. and do it in our pace and have time to make really excellent products. Mm -hmm. um, to do it with your customers is something I think by now we must be the most crowdfunded fashion project in Europe. Mm -hmm. At least some people have said that before. Mm -hmm. um, but that comes from doing the ultimate product development and uh, all the feedback and so on. If, if you're open-minded and listening to all these inputs from your early adopters, mm -hmm. it defines your brand. It makes your, your product launches and product development way better. Mm -hmm. And then I realized... You know, if our target group was 18 year old men, I wouldn't have this approach. And then I would ask them, hey, can you make content and take your friends and whatever. But if your target group, like it is for us as men who are between 30 and 50 years old, the best way to get them engaged is to ask for help. Okay. Yeah. So from our first Kickstarter campaign, we asked the backers, I think there was 3000 backers of the first one. Uh, the, wh why did you, why did you back our project? 68% said it, it's because I wanted to help Cash Fund okay. It was not because I wanted this shirt. Mm -hmm. They wanted to help. Right. And that was mind-blowing to us. Yeah. And then we just went along with it. So that the customers actually, they put in more than a million euros in equity investments. And they own more than 30% of the company. Mm -hmm. And they borrowed us money for all of our stores. Uh, 800,000 in total. They, they pre-ordered products for... Uh, must be like one and a half million euros by now, where they wait up to six months until we deliver. Like they give it to us now. And then yeah, we wait. yeah. And uh, that's the one thing that makes me feel the best and the most proud. Mm -hmm. I cannot believe that so many people care about our company. It's yeah. Not that many. Maybe in total, we're talking about a thousand people who are really engaged. Still. <laughs> I, I don't need a hundred thousand fans or something like that. If no. I have a thousand people who loves coming to our events, and loves mm -hmm. giving feedback and help out with stuff, then I'm a very happy man. Yeah. Um. It sounds then like what you just said, but they want to buy from Casper and Lotte. And also earlier, you also said the same that you want to sell it to them. It sounds like you have quite, uh, you're quite present as a personal brand. Like you are the brand in that sense. Do you find that personal branding plays a big role in the success here? I would say Lotte is much better at that okay. than me. <laughs> okay. Uh, but that's really a big impact she has on this company because she just has a sincere interest in, in most humans. Mm -hmm. she, if she can hear our customers down here, we, we, have, um, we have the names of the people who finance this store on the wall behind the counter in the yeah. store. Yeah. Whenever one of these guys are in the store and Lotte can hear it and she's sitting upstairs, then she will run down and say hi. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday we had sent out a survey. We got, a thousand res uh, we got like 2,000 results. 21 of them had a negative experience. Then Lotte makes sure that she and a, a, a guy from customer service, that the two of them write every single one of those 21 mm -hmm. and converts them into happy customers. Mm -hmm. Who does that? That's, yeah. uh, that? 
I think that's just amazing and you can feel that on the website and you can feel it in everything that it's just it's just a more human company than most yeah is that scalable uh, that's a good question um is that even a goal is maybe the first question to scale it uh it's scalable and yes it's a goal mm -hmm. but it's not scalable if you do top-down management so that it's lot or me who has to do all of this mm -hmm. We have to hire people who have a, a real heart for the company mm -hmm. and who adapt the ways of Lotte when they sit in customer service and stuff like that. If you go in and read through our Trustpilot reviews, you will see that there's hundreds of examples where they're saying, hey, this guy, Simon, in customer service, he was so incredible to me. So I think if you use 10 minutes on Trustpilot, you can see it's scalable. Mm -hmm. If you hire the right people and you give them the feeling of ownership, that enables them to excel. How do you know if it's the right person? Because, I mean, obviously you have a conversation with them, I know, but mm -hmm. yeah, how? <laughs> yeah, that's a, good, that's a good question. And also when we're opening a second office in, in Copenhagen next mon month, it's harder because you're not next to them. Mm -hmm. But we spend a lot of time with people in mm -hmm. general. Also on Fridays, hang out, getting to know them. We have these one-on-one -on -one walks in the park every six weeks yep. where we don't talk about business, but we also talk about their personal lives. Mm -hmm. And Lotte can especially get really, really deep during these talks. Mm -hmm. So if you show a sincere interest in these people and they respond well to it, then they are probably also interested in showing a sincere interest towards other people they work with or, uh, or do business with. Yeah. So we spoke about Lotte a little bit now. Obviously, you also mentioned you're marrying your co-founder soon. Uh, first of all, how important is it to have a co-founder, at least in your situation? Uh, I would not want to be an entrepreneur without having a co-founder. I okay. think I really respect the people who can do it, but uh, it's also a social thing. Mm -hmm. And I need people to bounce ideas off with, and I need other people who care as much as me. Yeah. If I go home to a girlfriend and I want to talk about all the things I did during the day and they could not care less or they're trying to be engaged, but really it's just my small little business, mm -hmm. then it would not, then, then, I, then I would not be a very exciting boyfriend to be with. Right. Uh, so it does not, it's not like it has to be my girlfriend in order no. to be a good co-founder, <laughs> not like no, that. No. And in a lot of these situations, it wouldn't work. Yeah. But we actually met each other at work. Right. We have always worked together from the first day we saw each other. Mm -hmm. And if we bring the dog to work, we walk in the park on the way here. Mm -hmm. um, and so far, I, uh, I love it. Mm -hmm. It's not always fun, but it's much more fun than doing it with someone else. <laughs> Fair. Because I was going to say, a lot of people, I think, would struggle. I mean, co-founder, not necessarily, but do you, uh, like, I don't want to get too much into your relationship either, but... Do you also, are you able to turn it off? Is it like, because I could imagine that's one of the hardest things, right? I tried it for a while with my girlfriend and well, that particular thing didn't really work out well yeah. because it's hard to switch off. How do you guys make that work? That, that is the key to doing this for sure. Mm -hmm. Because with my previous co-founder, who's also just an amazing guy, mm -hmm. I had the benefit, in the beginning we lived together when we launched it and we were sitting on the cardboard boxes. That was really intense. After three months, we're like, fuck, we need to get our own apartments. Yeah, yeah. This is, we're gonna kill <laughs> each other. <laughs> as soon as we had our own places, it's all good. Okay. Because then after work, you go home and hang out with your girlfriend. Yeah. Uh, now, when we go home in the evening, it's very important for me to not work at home. Mm -hmm. So if we gotta have a meeting on a Saturday or Sunday, we go to So House, we go to, um, I got a members club here and then we sit down and we go to a cafe. Yeah. But we don't sit in the living room. In the beginning, it would happen that we're lying in bed, going to sleep. And then we start planning stuff for the next day. Mm -hmm. And then you shut off the light and then your eyes, boom. Mm -hmm. No, that's the worst. So yeah. rule number one was no business talk in the bedroom. Okay. But now it's sort of expanded to the whole house. Yeah. Except for the balcony. Okay. The balcony is where we have it's a neutral heater. zone. Yeah. <laughs> we have a heater and a couch and stuff. <laughs> It's yeah. a nice view of the, um, of the canals. When we come home yesterday, then we turn off from candlelights, you get a glass of wine and we sit out there mm -hmm. and then we can sit and talk about the day. Mm -hmm. But as soon as we go inside, then it's off. Fair enough. Yeah. I think that's very unique. Um, 
but I'm happy for you that you guys are making it work. That's uh, it doesn't always work, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but no. in general, it works quite well. Even yeah. um, working from home, mm -hmm. we both do that, but never on the same days. Right. We tried it a few times, and then it doesn't work very well. Yeah. Then I'm too noisy, and I have phone calls all the time, and Lada doesn't. Then I have to be out on the balcony, and but she can still hear me. Yeah. Like, why are you typing so loud on your <laughs> keyboard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Fair. Yeah. So. I mean, that's, I think that's a good rule. That say uh, house is a neutral zone, uh, no work, but sounds logical at least. At least if you have a good place, you can can hang out close to your house. Yeah, then, fair. then it works. Yeah. We we live close to this office, mm -hmm. and we have the uh, the clubhouse also walking distance, and then. Mm -hmm. then it's an easy choice so obviously to go back to Labfresh at least you mentioned that you're now uh, scaling into Copenhagen and Rotterdam right yeah with the stores Retail yeah stores. with the stores yeah yeah, yeah. Um, does that sort of expansion the growth of the company does that bring any added pressure for you with it uh, retail brings pressure in the sense that I'm not a retail guy I love the internet Mm -hmm. I uh, did my, my first Facebook ad, uh, we were building those in 2013 mm -hmm. and it blew my mind. And that was what made my first business scalable. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. And then we started, we opened this store one and a half years ago. And then suddenly I realized this is how you make money. <laughs> I've been burning money for eight years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stores are profitable. People yeah. pick up their own products and there's no returns. This is amazing. Yeah. We need more of these. Yeah. Uh, so it adds some pressure because it's, uh, a building like this, is, we spent together with the landlord more than 400,000. The one in Copenhagen is more than 500,000. So it's huge building projects, at least for us. Yeah. Um, but it was way more pressure in the beginning when we thought, fuck retail, we're going to sell online to the whole world. Okay. The first two years, we shipped shirts to 98 countries, mm -hmm. to the Maldives and French Guinea and Fiji Islands. And that was a mess because boxes get lost. And you that like it, it was impossible to, to try to make a profit of it and try yeah. to get order and things. Yeah. I only really started enjoying this business when they said, <laughs> stop that. Yeah. Now we mainly focus on Denmark, Germany, and Netherlands. And yeah. the rest, we, we still ship there. Yeah. But we don't do paid marketing and we don't really focus on it. Yeah, yeah. You um, mentioned that you then, this op store opened one and a half years ago. Yeah. What was that like in the middle of Corona then? Yeah, when we signed the contract, we didn't believe that there would be a second lockdown. Yeah. So that sucked. Yeah. Um, but we started signing it because before Corona, we really wanted a store here on Van Balestrad. Yeah. But we could not believe how expensive they were. Of course. It, yeah. was, uh, it was out of our league. Yeah. And we didn't think we could ever make enough revenue to make it worth it. Yeah. But then we start talking to people during the first lockdown. And we start, I went around the, the nine streets and realized there was 15 empty spaces. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe now is the time to make a good deal. Yeah. And you totally could. Yeah. So it took a lot of the um, pressure out yeah. that the rent was lower for a very long time. It still is. Like the first couple of years you pay less in rent. Mm -hmm. Then you have time to learn the game before it's really serious. Yeah. So before we started recording, you mentioned that you tried a similar approach to me in the sense that you, that you also interviewed a bunch of people and wrote a book. Tell me a little bit more about that, that yeah. process. Yeah, I wish we had podcasts back in uh, 2010 when I lived in China. Yeah. But uh, what, yeah. Sorry, first of all, what brought you to China? Uh, that was uh, when I did my master's degree. I did one year in Copenhagen and one year in Guangzhou in China. Mm -hmm. at an MBA program. Mm -hmm. While I was at that MBA program, I, uh, I wanted to stay in China afterwards. I loved Asia. And uh, I interviewed way more people than I needed to during my thesis writing in order to, every time I interviewed a Danish executive, I would give him a card and say, hey, I'm also looking for a job in China. Mm -hmm. And I realized I had a lot of material. So then I applied for some scholarships to write a book in Denmark. You can get scholarships for anything. You can really throw it <laughs> yeah. around. Yeah. And I got a scholarship to turn my thesis work into an academic book about luxury cons consumption in China. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, was, that was amazing. So it could stay longer. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. I think it sold 300 copies. So like I'm basically a best-selling author. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So obviously my podcast is called The Quarter Life Crisis. Would you say you had a quarter life crisis? Um, I don't really think so. Okay. No, not yet. Uh, I think I've been very fortunate in my life. I didn't have... Everything was going relatively how I wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's it, good. It doesn't mean that I have taken over the world and made the biggest business in the world. No. I had the best relationship in the world or anything. Yeah. But I didn't have a situation where I looked at my life and think, this sucks, I gotta change something. Mm-hmm. So one of the reasons why I started this is because I struggled with the question of trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And one of the main reasons for that is because there are just so many options. Even with a master in this in case, for me, I still feel like it's an endless list of opportunities. Do you have any advice when it comes to figuring out what path to follow? Um... I would say look less at what other people are doing mm-hmm. and this envy game that is just it just makes sense you used to being in school and comparing your grades with everyone else mm-hmm. and as soon as you graduate you're looking at who gets a job the fastest who gets jobs at the coolest places or the best titles or the highest salaries you compare everything when you just graduate and that's stupid mm-hmm. I understand and it's very very true that the first move you make also defines your eventual salary. Like there's plenty of data supporting that. Mm-hmm. Having a good brand name on your CV also matters and so on. But you can choose a direction and stick with it. And that direction can fit where you have a passion and that will in the long run pay out. I'm very convinced of that. So why did you not have that, or or maybe you did, by the way, this um, pressure that you spoke of postgraduate? Oh, I totally had that. Okay. Uh, I also always make the best roadmaps, not just in business, but also for life. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I make them for Lotte. I put mm-hmm. them in uh, Excel sheets at home and I put them, we have a personal uh, Asana board, like mm-hmm. a, like a yeah, yeah, Asana, yeah. yeah like a project management board. She hates it, she doesn't want to look at the <laughs> board, but I gotta make some life plans too. Yeah, exactly. You know, I will plot in things that I want in the next couple of years. Yeah. And I also had that when I graduated. So I knew I wanted to have a startup again, Right. but I also knew that I wanted to get a big corporate job first. I tell myself that it was just because I wanted to learn from, from uh, experienced people. But of course, it was also about me wanting a good salary because mm-hmm. I had been uh, a relatively broke uh, student for a while. Mm-hmm. And I also wanted the prestige, the people that I studied with who saw me spending all my time working on my startup and, and then not getting as high grades as I otherwise could have. Mm-hmm. Maybe I kind of wanted to show them that just so you know, I can get the most attractive job. Yeah. And that's a stupid motivation. Yeah. But on the other hand, uh, that was also one of the reasons why my former, my, my first co-founder found me to be an attractive partner because I had that stamp. Okay, he's he's a top talent because he did this and this. Yeah. So you don't regret having taken that path? I don't think it was a, an option for me to not think about these things, but because I had the five-year map mm-hmm. in mind, Yeah. If I didn't get into the big corporate job or whatever, then I would, I would just have skipped that step and then I could still have been happy. I, yeah, I really exactly. think so. Yeah. I was not too narrowly focused. I, could, I always have a plan B and C. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Um, I'm already at my last question. And that question is, what does the future hold for Casper and Lotte? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. Uh, what matters in this phase? So when you're growing a startup, uh, you reach a phase, in the beginning you're operational, you have your hands in everything and you need to know everything and it's also what's expected from the team that you know what the hell is going on in every corner of your business. At some point you scale uh, um, away from that. That's usually when the team is between 20 and 30 people because you can't have your fingers in all those cookie boxes. We are a little bit stuck in the middle of that but we have around 20 people and we're still operationally involved but when you're operationally involved on the level we are, you don't have time to be a really good manager or to, to really focus on the strategy. Um, and in order to be nicer uh, and develop the people that we have in our team, that's what needs to happen in the coming years. Me and Lotto needs to replace ourselves with everything that we are touching operationally right now. Everything where we feel like we're the, we're the ones who have end responsibility for this process that we will hand over to other people. 
Amazing. Yeah. And then uh, a bigger thing is also that we for a long time because we have Germany has always been our uh, number two or number three country. Mm-hmm. We've been just talking about how we're just going to be doing Germany. But now it feels really good that we decided that we actually don't think it's very exciting to do business in Germany. Mm-hmm. There's too many returns. And we also we lived there and we didn't like it that much. And uh, now we just decided we're going to do uh, Paris and New York next. And uh, that's the goal. And we say it out in, in public. And by saying it in public, it becomes it becomes a real ambition. Yeah. And I like that. Yeah. And, you know, there's a risk that it won't happen. And then it sounds stupid. Yeah, you've been talking about New York for three years and you didn't open anything yet. I'm okay with that risk. That's fine. Yeah. Every time we do crowdfunding or something, that's the risk that no one will support it. Yeah. And we're standing there with a two minute video saying, please support our project. Yeah. And then we don't get funded. Every time the, that risk is there. So yeah. yeah, I'm excited about those. I'm excited about the US and, and France. And mm-hmm. uh, then we're going to do that. Is the lesson here to become excited about risks? Because I feel like that is not... Um... That's a very good point. Uh, well, excitement in general will make it more likely that other people get excited about what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And I need to get some uh, local co-founder, country manager, whatever you call it, in Paris to be excited because I don't want to manage how they run France. I want to be want to support them, but I need someone to be very autonomous and independent there. Yeah. And if I'm not excited about that country, I'm not going to visit enough. I'm not going to I'm not going to check in enough and care enough. Yeah. No. Awesome. And then the risk uh my lesson there is the opposite i liked risk way too much as a young man okay our first vc she was very much calling us you're two very aggressive young men and we like it <laughs> and i needed to get less aggressive okay some of the angel investors we have now were also clear about that in the beginning that i should relax yeah. don't burn so much money yeah yeah have some patience uh lot also says that a lot more patience so risk is great, but the rest of my team, the rest of the world are not into risk on the same level as me. Mm-hmm. So I got to take less of it. Mm-hmm. And also with maybe not wanting everything overnight then, I guess, or as quick as possible. But instead, what you also explain about the way, what it at least sounds to me, how you run the business is sometimes by sort of pausing and speaking to your customers and reflecting that... Yeah. You're able to pick up on things which are make it more profitable and scalable in the long run. If we were making software or something like that, we could go harder. But the fact is, we make our own product and it's really complicated. It's a physical product. <coughs> we make our own fabric and we choose fibers and stuff. So I already ordered now what we are going to sell 10 months from now. Mm. We ordered 50% more products. So I know... I cannot sell more than fi- I can. I cannot grow more than fifty-seven percent because that's the products we have. Yeah, that's just something that I have to accept. So mm-hmm. when something is working really well, right now pants and the most popular shirts they're all sold out. Mm-hmm. That's how it goes. Yeah, I just have to. This is how it is when you make a physical product. Yeah. Awesome. I'm really inspired, also especially about how you tackle things differently at least what it feels like to me Um, you can already be very proud of what you have achieved and i want to thank you for your time and with that thanks for coming by